I'm Valerie Paradis. I'm Vice President of Services and Supports at Autism Speaks. I, I formerly served on our board of directors, and about seven months ago, I joined the team at Autism Speaks, and it's been um, a wonderful transition uh, for me, and it's especially meaningful today for me to be here. There are lots of familiar friends and faces and other people I look forward to meeting um, in the course of the next two days. Uh, we have a very um, wonderful group of panelists here uh, who will be sharing some of their perspectives on transition. Um, before I start, I, I just want to share that, um, like my, my fellow panelists, I'm also um, autistic. I was diagnosed uh, late in life when I was 40 years old. And I'm also a parent of a 29-year-old uh, son who is on the spectrum of autism as well. So this particular theme of transition is very near and dear to my heart. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what my uh, my friends on the spectrum here have to share with all of you and the conversations uh, that follow over the next two days. So I'm going to just start by um, letting you know everyone's names. They've all prepared introductions, so I'm not going to get into that too much. But to my right here is Paul Kotler. And um, Paul's mother, Melinda, is here also as a communication support for Paul. Um, to my left here is Bridget Rankowski and Katie Davis. Um, one way we prepared for this panel was uh, I shared questions in advance with all the participants so that they would have the opportunity to prepare, um, prepare answers and also just prepare introductions. And um, I'm going to start with a first round of questions that each panelist will respond to. Um, and I'll just repeat out loud sort of to all of you what the questions were that um, we asked the panelists to prepare for during this first round of questions. So um, first of all, please introduce yourself briefly. So everyone will do that. And then following that, they will um, lead into the first two questions that we have for them. The first was, Please share with us your experience of transitioning to adult life. What were the challenges? And what empowered you or made you feel proud? The second question is, during this period in your life of transition, did you use or access any innovations that were helpful, such as technology, programs, or methods of learning? If so, please share some examples. So I just want to preface this too, and I think maybe uh, Arun Kapoor mentioned this earlier, but throughout the, the, the next two days, as we all speak about innovations and programs, we just want you to know that um, Autism Speaks doesn't endorse anything specifically, <laughs> um, but we do want free and open discussion here and candid discussion. So um, with that, I'm going to start with Paul. Um, Paul Kotler to respond to the first question. My name is Paul Kotler. I type to communicate. I am a junior in college majoring in psychology and an advocate for those lacking an ability to communicate. I am very excited to be here. I have a lot of anxiety. It's hard work. Sometimes it may look like I am not listening. But I am. Not being able to speak was my biggest challenge. I first began typing at 14. It changed my life. I felt I could communicate all I knew. It was still hard inside to not speak. At an advocacy training at Austin, I accepted myself as a typer. My typing is a challenge because it is slow. 
I always need to get assignments as early as possible. I take one class at a time. It is difficult to keep up with conversations. But I am so grateful to have this tool to communicate. Other challenges are dyspraxia, when I can't make my body do what my brain tells it to, and sensory needs, but I keep improving. It matters that people need to have an understanding of sensory needs and dyspraxia, and that equating these with a lack of intelligence is causing meaningful lives to be denied, and these lives are important. I very much have anxiety, but I overcome it to meet my goals. Planning to go to college was complicated. My academic experience was not traditional, so I needed my GED. My GED teacher knew I understood the material, but needed the classroom experience. She believed in me, and made me a respected member of the classroom. After I passed the GED I started at the community college, but they would only let me take online classes. I transferred to Widener and it was very different. They make accommodations I need to be successful in the classroom. My anxiety makes me impulsive and that makes me more anxious. It takes very calming support, and I have a communication assistant in class and throughout the day, and a counselor who is a behavior specialist, who helps me too. Yes, sex. Being acknowledged as an intelligent person after years of being unable to communicate was liberating. My advocacy work really fulfills me. The people in need of a way to communicate deserve to be heard. Making a plan with all the steps to achieve my goal of going to college helped me move toward it, and was empowering. A strengths-based approach helped me to work with my therapists as allies to set goals that would support me in achieving my goals. For me, having my family and friends believe in me help me feel confident. The rapid prompting method led to my communication breakthrough. Occupational therapy, using sensory integration and motor planning work, and speech therapy, continue to help me. Counseling helps me have insight and is making a big difference for me. Having this team allows me to continue to achieve my goals. Paul, thank you so much for your thoughtful answers, and um, we're just really pleased that uh, we could have you here today as a typer joining all of us on the panel. So thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to move on next to, um, to Katie Davis uh, as our next contributor. Hi, I'm Katie Davis. I am 24 years old. I am a Autism Speaks intern as of two weeks ago. And I am also a graduate student at Drexel University in Philadelphia getting my master's in public health with uh, um, public health policy and management. Um, my biggest challenges, I guess, for transitioning to adult life was uh, actually moving away from home, since home was always what I considered a comfort zone. Um, 
it was also hard because I I was on the same coast, but I went to Portland, Oregon, which is not California. <laughs> And I ended up with roommate. I it was too hard having a roommate. I wasn't used to it. I'm used to having my own space. And uh, another challenge was I ended up my second year ending up hospitalized with a blood clot to my leg, and that was not only terrifying, but I also had to get to the hospital myself. And I wasn't very familiar with all the hospital stuff, so um, it was hard. But I still managed to power through it. And then the next day, uh, mom put dad on a red eye to uh, help. It was also hard now as a graduate student, California is still considered my home. And being on the East Coast is not only a bit of a culture change, but uh, it's very difficult to also remember that you cannot call your parents at six o'clock in the morning because it's three o'clock there. <laughs> I have done that a few times, they were not happy. <laughs> um, what empowered me to feel proud? Um, my family has always been my biggest supporter. Um, they have always backed me up sometimes, whether it be, you know, pushing me or, in my mother's case, nagging me, but it's all for a good end. Um, they always told me, you are capable of anything that you put your mind to. On top of that, I was privileged to go to a all-girls Catholic high school, which was a preparatory school for college, where they really pushed me and helped me be able to get into college that I, um... And also, they were always willing to help me in any capacity. Um, the teachers were always willing to set aside time to help me. And um, the other, um, I was also on a robotics team for the four years I was there. So um, that also helped me in terms of relationships and, you know, working as a team. Um, I didn't have any particular innovations at the time. I did have um, a... I did get accommodations briefly for math, as math is not my favorite subject, and I still don't like it. Uh, but um, other than that, I've just learned over the years, you know, you can do anything, put your mind to it, keep working, and you will succeed in life. Up to you. Thanks, Katie. And um, our next respondent is uh, Bridget Rankowski. I have to time myself because I know myself. Um, hi, so I'm Bridget Rankowski. As you can tell by the number of badges I have, um, I'm autistic. I'm a family member. I'm an educator. Uh, I'm a professional circus performer, the executive director of a nonprofit I started, uh, master's degree. Um, I do freelance writing for Autism Speaks now. Um, I serve on the board of the Autism Society of Maine. And I'm sure there's a lot of other things that I do that I'm also forgetting, um, <laughs> which ties into the next thing. Um, I also attended an all-girls uh, Catholic preparatory school, um, but I feel that my transitioning into adulthood was very disjointed. When I was 16 years old, I had a traumatic brain injury. I had retrograde amnesia from that injury, so I had to relearn all the basic things, like how to hold a pencil, how to feed myself, who's looking at me back in the mirror. Um, so that was during high school, and at the exact same time, uh, our family was dealing with a very abusive and unsafe living situation. So home was not a safe haven for me. At the exact same time, because of course, like nothing happens like one at a time. Uh, my brother is what you might describe back then as severely involved in his autism. Uh, when he was younger, he was non-speaking. He was a flight risk. He was everything that you might kind of think of as stereotypic autistic behaviors. And because I present as quote unquote high functioning, I didn't receive the same services. Um, my brother was getting occupational therapy, physical therapy. I'm 30 years old and 
I just started physical therapy um, because about a year ago I got hit by a car because of course, like, this is just a pattern of my life. Like, um, and I started occupational therapy too. And it's been a game changer. So my transition into adulthood in high school when it came to trying to find a college because my high school insisted everyone apply to a college, my only requirement was I don't want to stay where I am. I need to go somewhere else. So I went to a college fair where there was a desk that said Cornell. And one of my special interests is animals and animal behaviorism. And Cornell University has this one professor who's done a lot of work on gray wolves. This was Cornell College. And I was too socially awkward to know how to walk away from the table when I went up like all excited. Um, needless to say, that's my alma mater now. Um, but Cornell College is an amazing school that you take one class at a time for 18 days. And then the entire college has three days off. You go to school from Monday to Friday, uh, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Everyone has the same lunch. And... It was really stimmy. Um, there were a lot of people who were neurodiverse that ended up finding that school. Um, but throughout the high school process to get me there, it was not the easiest thing. I found my solace and my skills uh, through extracurriculars. I went to Barbizon Modeling School before my head injury, so I know how to dress the dress. Um, I know how to present myself and have conversations because I threw myself into theater and performing, but my heart has always been in community service. I received awards from the Kiwanis. Um, one of my dark secrets is I was in a beauty pageant once, um, and I got the community service award. Um, and for me, a lot of the tools that I needed in order to help me transition were access to technology. Um, I still have trouble holding a pencil. I have a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos, so I can't write as fast as my brain thinks. So Paul and I kind of have that in common. Um, so I always use the computer and then I found out in the real world, a computer is not really an accommodation. Like they'll let you bring a computer to college class and you don't need a doctor's note. And that was wonderful. Um, I also really had the support of community members uh, through the difficult time of domestic violence, of finding myself as an autistic member of the community. I'm really thankful that my mother brought me to the Autism Society of America conference when I was 15. So I've spent literally half of my life in this environment and I was able to find amazing mentors like the woman sitting next to me. Um, and I have other mentors that were able to help me through high school, navigating the social minefield, realizing I'm not alone. And because of one of those autistic characteristics of not having a lot of peers your own age, having older peers that were like, no, it gets better. You can go to college. Like, life is going to get better for you. Um, and having that support. So. I really am thankful for the community support as well as having extracurricular options to, to help me grow as a person. Thanks, Bridget. Um, I want to say before I uh, present the next question to the panelists that if, um, if you all have questions for any of the three panelists in this session. If you can just write them down um, and pass them in to me after we Bridget, finish. Bridget. And when the next panel comes up uh, of researchers, um, we'll be following up after that with all, all the panelists together for the Q&A. So um, if you do have questions, just pass them to me when we come back down. And that way, I can get them to the panelists on time so that they can prepare their answers for you. 
and have some time to process. So Paul, I'm going to um, present you with the final question that all three of you will be responding to. And um, this one will kind of segue also to our researchers, which I'm really eager to hear their perspective on this as well. Um, but the question is, what do you think are meaningful outcomes in transition to adult life? And um, I've asked all the panelists to also s provide some examples. So you're up, Paul. <laughs> I have worked hard to be in college and to be an advocate, and housing is the next needed step. There needs to be housing for each autistic person, not just the highest functioning. I'm looking to collaborate in a project, acting as a consultant. I can help, but I need a certified, focused team, really committed to meet goals. A university town could really be the best place, because the students in related classes could integrate autistic individuals, through their own network of friends and local businesses, bridging the gap from housing to community. Occupational and speech therapists and counselors and behavior therapists are important to help with a successful transition and ongoing consultation. I feel I am ready for a move to my place and want the independence. For it to be successful will take careful planning and necessary supports. I think this type of housing would be great for those in the community, as well as those like me on the spectrum. Thanks, Paul. Those are all very important and very weighty matters. And um, your contribution to the conversation is very important. So I'm going to move on next to Katie for her thoughts on this. Okay. Okay. Um, well, um, some of the um, meaningful outcomes for me have already passed. I graduated high school. I graduated college. Heck, if I wasn't going to graduate college in four years, uh, I did it. <laughs> Not the way I started, but I, I got there. Um, the next most obvious goal is um, finishing my master's degree, and then the next outcome is getting a job. That's going to be a whole different ballpark. Uh, any takers? <laughs> um, another one is getting housing. I currently have an apartment a couple blocks from the school, actually a couple blocks from the Directional Autism Institute, too, so that's always helpful. Um, uh, getting... Well, another one that's personal to me is getting a cat. I am very cat deprived, thank you very much. And that is gonna, that's just another thing of owning your own cat. It's different when you have pets at your own, your parents' place, but when you have your own cat, that's a whole different thing. Um, possibly getting a car. I have leased a car before, but actually being responsible for your own car, changing it, putting, uh, I guess, uh, tires on it and stuff like that. And but you can hire someone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And um, ultimately, to be a productive member of society and eventually, uh, you know, retire with enough money to live happily for the rest of the years I have out of retirement. Thanks, Katie. Bridget? Um, so I had shared that my transition to adulthood was kind of disjointed. Um, I had to drive a car before I actually legally had a license because, well, certain rescue operations, shall we say. Um, so I feel that when we discuss meaningful transitions into adult life, we have to look at the entire spectrum. Uh, and we have to look at different areas that are not just getting someone into a housing um, situation. Uh, you mentioned roommates and stuff, and I can, fully admit that I've had my fair share of like 
shall we say, horror movie situations. Um, so finding appropriate housing situations. We also have to talk about what are the uh, meaningful outcomes related to emotional wellness and social wellness of having our adults going into communities and being engaged in the community activities that are interest appropriate, um, not just in sheltered environments, but integrating into community events, music events, art, culture. Um, I throw myself into situations where people are like, are you not nervous and terrified? And I'm like, oh yeah, I am, I'm shaking. Um, but I'd rather be anxious than live with the regret of man, I wish I had gone to this place, which has brought me into some amazing adventures. Um, you can feel free to ask me about them. Um, but I also think we have to talk about what is it the individual wants as their outcome. I am someone like many Americans who has graduated with lots and lots and lots of student loans. Um, I have a master's degree. Maybe college isn't the right option uh, for my younger brother who's I had mentioned before he was severely involved. Now he, you know, eats pizza all the time, has trouble cleaning up his apartment and stuff. So like he's the average kid you guys all like we wanted to grow up to. Um, but we pushed him for technical school and said, hey, you can take technical classes at the community college and also take some film classes and some art. So he'll be able to graduate with the certificate to immediately go into well-paying workforces. Um, that is a really good option that we can encourage. Volunteering, um, getting people involved in the communities uh, if employment is not the direct step. Um, but I think that when we talk about some of the transitioning to adult life, we also need to talk about interpersonal relationships. We need to talk about um, healthy relationships Relationships, how we can have that balance. And I know it's something that I say a lot when I give presentations, but we spend a lot of effort telling autistic kids how they should treat their friends. We do not spend enough time telling autistic kids and adults how we should be treated. And that is something that has caused me harm, that has caused my friends on the spectrum harm, because we don't sometimes realize the red flags, we want social communication, and we can't pick up the hidden meanings. And I also think something that's really important as we uh, talk about transitioning into adulthood and a meaningful outcome is self-regulation and the balance of work, of social, of, okay, maybe you can't do the 40 hour a week job. I can't. Um, but how can you find that balance so that you are fulfilled and that you are having a good quality of life? Because isn't that why we're here, isn't that what we want for our children, our relatives, other members of the community to find that amazing balance so that they wake up every day and maybe go to a job or an opportunity that they enjoy, come home, have a cat. I mean, my cats are awesome. Talk to us about our pets. Um, and then they can spread their strengths to others because Again, like I wouldn't be here if I didn't have other members of the community supporting me. And I hope to give the message to others about strengths and skills. So hopefully other people can do that too. Thank you so much, Bridget. And I want to thank all of our panelists for their contribution today. And just a reminder again, if you have questions for them and you want to write them down and pass them to me, I'll be sure they get them for the Q&A session. And uh, next, we'll be passing this over to the next panel group. So thank you. Here we go. Thank you. I'm Lauren Lindstrom, and I have the pleasure of following uh, my friend and colleague, Eric Carter. So I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I want to start with a just a couple thank yous. Thanks to Arun for inviting me to join you, and all of you for being part of this really uh, 
interesting combination of people. It's really unique to be in a room full of researchers and family members and policy people and advocates. And when I think about our field and where we need to go in transition, this is how we make change. We don't make change by ourselves in our offices. We make change by having this community of people with different perspectives who are coming together to really think carefully about what is transition and what can transition be in the future. So thanks for having me. Thanks to Eric again for that really thoughtful reflection on where we've been and what, what are some of the considerations in terms of what we know and don't know. I was also asked to think about those same questions. What do we know about transition? Where might we need to think more deeply? What are some areas that are challenging? And so um, I'll go back to 1990 myself. Um, many of you remember that that was the year that IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, was first passed. Um, we had the transition mandates, transition planning mandated for the very first time. That was the year I was finishing up my master's degree in special education. And I was going to go be a high school teacher. That was my plan. I was at the University of Oregon. And at that time, there were some professors there at the University of Oregon by the name of Mike Benz and Andy Halpern. You may have seen those names in your archives of transition. And they said to me, you know, Lauren, you, you don't really want to go be a teacher right now. We have this great opportunity for you. We're going to start this program. It's called Youth Transition Program. We're going to put schools and rehab together. And we're going to build this collaborative services in high schools. Uh, prior to getting my master's degree, I'd worked in employment, been a job coach, and I went, sure, I could do that for a couple years. Well, that Oregon Youth Transition Program that was started in 1990 is still going today after 29 years, serves thousands of thousands of kids, help build partnerships. So I've been doing this work for a long time in a lot of different ways, thinking about what do we need to do with schools, what do we need to do with, with families, how do we build programs, how do we build curriculum, and really really grappling with what are these outcomes over time and what are the things we need to think about. So I want to spend um, my brief time with you today thinking about sort of considerations and some of the complexities in transition. So just a common framework, I think Eric mentioned this too, but we know that we have federal law that mandates that every child with a disability age 16 and above needs to have an individualized transition plan. It's also interesting when we look at that language uh, in the law that says, what is the whole purpose of special education? Well, we're teaching knowledge and skills and academics, but we're also preparing youth for the future. That's really clear, and that's been clear for almost 30 years, that special education is about preparation for the future. So we know that. That's a given. What else do we know? We know over those 30 years that there's been a substantial, I would say, investment in research on transition. We've seen model demonstration projects. We've seen longitudinal research projects. We've seen some randomized trials of different interventions. And there are a set of predictors, depending on which studies you read, there's around 16 of them that are evidence that we know that if these pieces are in place, it's going to impact outcomes in adulthood. So we know that if young people with autism are included in general education, we're going to see better at long-term outcomes. We know that if we can provide opportunities for advocacy and self-determination skills and social skills instruction in high school, that's going to make a difference over time. We know, this is one that's been consistent for many, many years, we know that work experience in high school makes a difference. If young people have an opportunity to work and learn about the world of work, they're much more likely in adulthood to be in employment. And then finally, we know that transition programs, integrated sets of services, transition planning, we know that's effective. So those are just five of these 16 or 17 predictors that are known and clear and research-based. So put those things together. We have a federal mandate to do transition. We have evidence-based predictors. And yet, I have this question. So why do we still see what I would call opportunity gaps for youth with ASD in transition from school to adulthood. I borrow that language opportunity gaps from my colleagues at UC Davis who study inequities and especially in race, in race. And they say, you know, we often hear the word achievement gaps, but we flip it around and say it's not an achievement gap, 
It's an opportunity gap. And that means we have to do more than think about individuals and their skills and knowledge. We have to think about systems. So the opportunity gap, in my mind, is about our school systems, our community systems, and why is it that we have yet to figure out exactly what that combination of elements is that's going to support successful transition. So when I ask that question to myself, why do we still see opportunity gaps? Here's my answer. It's complicated. We see opportunity gaps because it's complicated. Every student, every family, every school, every community is different. And we have different configurations that are combining to influence these outcomes. We have to think about individuals, but we also have to think about the multifaceted nature of transition. And so I want to talk with you about three areas that I think might help us as we sort through some of those complexities and try to think about um, what are the outcomes that we want to change, improve over time. So these are three areas that I think map across um, the content outcomes that we are focused on the next three days. We're talking about employment. We're talking about post-secondary education. We're talking about community inclusion. If you think of those as rows going across, these three things, I would say, are the columns that intersect with all of those topical areas. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about equity. I want to talk about families. And I want to talk about collaboration and partnerships as these broad themes that I believe are critical to our discussions, and they're not the places we always start. So let me dive into this. My first topic is equity. And here's the question. What if transition outcomes were equitable across race, gender, and family income? The answer is right now they're not. Uh, we often think about young people with autism as a homogeneous group, and that's not necessarily true. We often compare young people with autism to their non-disabled peers, or we compare them to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But if you look at that group of young people with autism, there's lots of different variations, and individuals have complex identities that include their gender and identity, their family income, their race, their ethnicity, their language, their sexual orientation, et cetera. And I think we need to think about those complexities while we're thinking about young people with autism. So let me pull apart just a couple of these pieces. So when we think about race and ethnicity, we see uneven service delivery opportunities, and we see uneven outcomes when we look at young people of color, especially Native American, Latino, and black individuals with autism. We know that um, people are equally, depend, doesn't matter what race you are, you're equally likely to have autism, but oftentimes young people of color are not identified as early typically a little bit later, which means they may or may not have access to early services or early intervention. We also know that access to services is differentiated by race. Um, black children with autism are less likely to have health care, for example. And then finally, we know that if you look at race and ethnicity, post-school outcomes are different. Um, people of color with autism are less likely to be employed and less likely to attend college than their white peers. So that's a factor that we need to consider. And again, we need to think about this not as an individual deficit, but as a social deficit. And how do we think about our society and our communities so that all young people have access to these services when they are needed? The other thing that I think is important to think about when we think about these equity issues is what about socioeconomic status? When you read the reports about autism, you often think about a focus typically on white middle class or upper class young people. But I was just reading this National Autism Indicators report, and I'm surprised to see that almost half, 40 to 46 percent of teens with ASD live in low income households um, for a variety of reasons, right? And we know that disability can be both a cause and a consequence of poverty. And so there's that intersection of um, folks that are struggling in terms of their family income and their stability. Uh, one of four households of teens with autism receive some sort of public assistance. So you've got kids that are receiving food stamps or other kinds of, of aid to be able to do the day-to-day -day survival that's needed. We also know that young people with autism who live in low-income families are less likely to participate in transition planning. So you've got these differential experiences that I would argue also influence aspirations um, over time. 
The last piece I want to mention in terms of equity is this idea of gender and gender differences. Some of you that know me know that I've been working especially um, with young women with disabilities and young women with autism and really interested in what are the unique characteristics. Uh, I see in my work that young women are often face discrimination because of disability and also because of gender, and you get that double impact in terms of limited aspirations, and often young women with disabilities we see are less likely to be employed and often end up living in poverty. So you've got that, those pathways that are constricted, sometimes for young women. I was really excited to see our panel and see a couple of young women with autism on the panel. We know that young women are less likely to be identified. I just read these statistics. One in 37 males identified with autism. One in 151 females identified with autism. So there's a big gap there, and we don't know exactly why. Sometimes um, young women with autism might appear different and may not be noticed. Noticed, might be identified later. Um, some of the young women in my studies have said, I deliberately tried to act in a way where I would feel like I fit in. I masked my identity as an autistic person, and therefore maybe didn't have the same kind of supports or services needed. So we know that for young women with autism, high school experiences are quite different. Sometimes isolating young women with disabilities are less likely to be in work experience, which again, predictor of employment. They're less likely to be in career technical education, predictor of later employment, so they have constrained opportunities. The last thing I want to say about gender is that there's been very little work in this area of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth with autism. Just a few studies in that area, some of which were done by my doctoral students, um, and I think it's an important area of exploration. There's those, again, intersecting identities. We know that LGBTQ youth are often isolated. They face harassment. They're more likely to drop out higher su suicide ideation, and so you combine that also with a sometimes stigmatizing experience of having autism, and you have some barriers there, and also I think some unique strengths that need to be explored over time. So that's the piece about equity. Let me move to my next question, which is about families. And my question here is, what if all families had access to comprehensive and coordinated transition services and supports? I don't know that that is necessarily what's happening right now. I recently moved to California about two years ago after living in Oregon for many years. And when I talked to parents of kids with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities, they are frustrated. Um, they don't believe me when I say transition is possible and here's all the pieces. They say, uh, we don't know what the opportunities are. Uh, no one answers our phone calls. We don't feel listened to. So families are struggling. I see some people nodding their heads in the audience. Maybe there are family members or have had those experiences. What if we could change that? What if we could think about coordinated, family-centered services that really build around a family and look at strengths? Um, the other thing I wanted to say about families is that I was surprised to read that only 55% of families of children with autism, based on a national survey, participate in transition planning. That means 45% of those parents didn't even participate in the IEP or the transition plan, which is sometimes the one entree into coordination with school systems. So there's a barrier there. Some other things about families that I just want to mention as we're thinking through what needs to happen, what we know, what we need to know, is that we know that family involvement is critical for all kids, it affects education outcomes across the board, but we also know that for young people with disabilities, if families are involved, those young people are much more likely to work in the future, they're much more likely to attend college, just by the opportunity of participating in um, integrated planning and preparation for adulthood. We also know that family expectations make a difference. There's been some studies done that, that if a parent believes that their child is gonna to go to college, has that expectation, if a parent believes that their child can work, those young people are much more likely to achieve those outcomes. So expectations matter. Involvement matters, expectations matter, and then finally this idea about homeschool partnerships. And what does that really mean? It doesn't mean just asking a parent to come once a year and sit down and do a transition planning meeting. That'd be good, that's a good start, but it also means a more comprehensive opportunities for, for, for uh, parents to be involved in career planning, to be involved in career awareness, to be involved in all kinds of um, 
to route transition assessments and planning opportunities over time in collaboration with schools. Of all the parents that I've talked to, um, I have very rarely hear them say how excited they are about their IEP. What, <laughs> what, what they're excited about is my kid has a goal, this is what they want to do, and the school is helping them achieve that goal by having a variety of activities and I can see that there's a pathway to the future and it's in partnership with the school. So my last area of consideration that I think is important for transition is this idea of community collaboration and partnerships. We've heard that a little bit earlier from some of the other speakers about these, these different networks that need to be involved in transition. So here's the question here. What if schools and agencies could partner to develop and deliver coordinated systems of transition services? Now, like I said, I've been doing this work since 1990, trying to think about schools and rehab and community employers and how do we build those things. I think there are still a lot of challenges there um, because there's so many components, because there's so many regulations and policies that are different across the agencies. We really need to be a proactive and intentional if we're going to be able to build those kind of coordinated services. We also know that interagency collaboration is a predictor of better transition outcomes, but it's another one of those areas that's very much understudied. We need, it's very hard to describe collaboration and what do the pieces look like. Um, but I'll, um, I'll suggest to you that these are some of the areas where I think we need to work. Of course, at the federal level, uh, rehab services, education, et cetera, the, the state level, what are the policies that exist that can support transition? We need to think about institutions of higher education, including universities and community colleges, are, I think are a key partner that are maybe underutilized when we think about transition and transition opportunities. You've got advocacy organizations like Autism Speaks that are stepping up and thinking about transition. We need to work closely with employers. Um, we need to think about, again, not just preparing young people, but how do we prepare the community? How do we open up the doors of employment and have people that are willing to accept and nurture and advance individuals with autism? And then finally, of course, school districts are key partners for us in thinking about what are the different components. And it varies a lot from district to district. And so what are the ways we can support all districts and have some kind of essential services and the personnel to support those services in transition? So with that, I'll just close by saying again how thrilled I am to be here and to see all of you and, and understand the perspectives that you represent. I really do believe that there's a lot of hope here. There's a lot of opportunities here. We can build transition services together. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to um, talk with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you.